Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Tapping the Power of Content Analytics, Exploring this Powerful Solution. I'm Teresa Resick, Director of Webinars here at AIM, and AIM is your host and producer of today's event. And with me today are Seth Early of Early Information Science and Sid Propstein of AI Foundry. And AI Foundry is the underwriter of today's webinar, and we thank them for their support. And thank you for taking the time to join us today. And as we get started here, I just want to offer a few pointers for viewing today's webinar. You can, by joining the webinar live, you can customize your own viewing experience. So feel free to open or close or resize the different windows. Across the bottom of your screen is the list of all of the widgets available to you today. We do have a new feature for you, and that's the group chat. And by clicking this in the widget icons across the bottom of the screen, and it's uh, down there towards the bottom right, and with this, you'll be able to chat with each other and also with us here at AIM. So please be aware that everyone can see everything that's being posted in here. But I greatly encourage you to join in into the conversation. Do ask questions to the speakers throughout the hour using the Q&A feature. We will hold these until the end where we should have about five or 10 minutes to answer them. You can also use this feature to ask for technical assistance. You can download a PDF of the presentation at any time. Just look to the resources list that's to the right side of the slide area. There are also a few other documents and links in there to help you learn more about today's topic. And at the end of the webinar, a brief survey will open in your browser. And I would greatly appreciate it if you take a few moments to offer your feedback and to suggest other topics for us to cover here at AIM. And you can also access the survey in the list of widgets across the bottom of your screen. This webinar is being recorded, and it will be posted to AIM.org's Resources Webinars page in just a few days. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers that we have with us today. Seth Early is the CEO of Early Information Science, and he's the editor, editor of Data Analytics at IT Professional Magazine from the IEEE. His interests include knowledge strategy, data and information architecture, search-based applications, and information findability solutions. Seth has worked with a diverse roster of Fortune 1000 companies, helping them to achieve higher levels of operating performance by making information more findable, usable, and valuable through integrated enterprise structures supporting analytics, e-commerce, and customer experience applications. And Sid Probstein is a technology executive and hands-on product development leader with 20 plus years of experience delivering innovative enterprise content, search, big data, and analytics software and solutions. Sid is a recognized expert in big data and regularly speaks in industry events including MIT CIO, the Strata Hadoop World, and Bloomberg IT. So right now I am going to turn things over to Seth Early to begin his talk today. Seth? Terrific. Thank you, Teresa, and uh, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, nice to catch up with, with folks. Uh, Sid and I go, go way back, so uh, nice to uh, uh, work with you on this webinar. Uh, what I want to do is talk about uh, data analytics versus content analytics and kind of look at the differences between them. We're looking at the structured world and the unstructured world. And, you know, the structured world is very, is very mature. There's lots of applications that are kind of well known and well understood, but then the unstructured world is, is, is increasingly leveraging uh, lots of sources of data. We talked a little bit about big data, but lots of this dark data, lots of this uh, unstructured content and, and clickstream data and censored data and lots of other places where we can start looking at content and getting additional insights from content. Uh, what's really interesting is combining the two, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the, the applications uh, for content analytics and try to cover a couple of the, the, the unusual suspects, right? There's the usual suspects around things like class, uh, clustering and categorization and entity extraction, but then you can start to apply these to some interesting uh, areas and more interesting applications. So we'll, we'll get into some example uh, uh, applications. I'll talk about an approach. Just generally speaking, at a very high level, how do you need to think about text analytics? And how do you need to start thinking about um, you know, the approaches and the applications and what are the precursors? Uh, and then we'll get into a couple of, of specific uh, examples around things like protecting IP, uh, a, a less uh, considered one around product feature extraction. We'll talk about customer feedback analysis, and there's another one in there around uh, building question-answering systems. 
So again, when we start talking about data, data analytics, usually it's about structured uh, information. Usually it's about transactional types of information, uh, customer interactions or, or uh, purchases or sales or things that are statistically uh, uh, analyzed or looked at for the what happened. So like what, what was this? What were our sales? What was this customer outcome? And so on. Content analytics really gives us that understanding of the unstructured, you know, the, the, the why did it happen, right? There's really insights that come from, from, uh, from the why. And when you bring together the what and the why, that's when you really get insights that you can act on. And of course, we're seeing lots of other sources. There's lots of, of data exhaust that comes from different applications. There's lots of unstructured information that's coming from multiple channels. And organizations really need to start correlating the unstructured and the structured and really providing that, that 360-degree uh, set of insights um, around customers and processes from the unstructured and the structures. When I consider um, some of the applications, you know, people talk about dark data. What's dark data? Well, dark data is stuff that we just don't have any understanding of. We don't have any insight into. We don't know what it is. There's terabytes and terabytes of information sitting on hard drives and in applications that have sort of been, you know, dumped there. You know, the, 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 the digital landfill is, uh, is uh, 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 Mancini's uh, blog is, is referred to. It, it's, it's stuff that just gets pushed off. No one wants to deal with it. They're afraid to deal with it. They're afraid to throw it away. They're afraid to, to uh, migrate it. But really, how do we get insights on it? How do we identify uh, patterns within that data? And how do we understand structure? And that's really what text analytics can do for us in content analytics. I'm using those terms a little bit interchangeably, but content analytics is kind of a bigger uh, perspective on that. Knowledge extraction, how do we get pieces of knowledge, components of knowledge from the large document? Right? People usually don't want you know, an answer to be, you know, a 300-page document. They want the thing that's in that document that becomes the knowledge nugget. Um, compliance risks, right? There's lots of things that are going on with, you know, all sorts of industries, especially financial services, where you have risks that you're not doing something that you're supposed to or you're doing something you're not supposed to. And so a lot of that is locked up in content. And so how do you start understanding what, what that is and where it is? How about personally identifiable information, PII? Uh, that's strewn about, right? And a lot of legacy content before we had uh, the stringent controls that we have now. And in some cases, it just winds its way through processes and ends up in documents and content that can be discovered and, and get, get us in trouble. Um, the, I, I'm using this term here, analysis and disposition of dark data. So it's really looking at this from a perspective, you know what, I have a bunch of stuff here. Maybe I'm migrating to the cloud. Maybe I'm decommissioning servers or applications. What do I do with it, right? Do I throw it away? Can I throw it away? Uh, protection of intellectual property. You know, there's, there's lots of situations where, you know, organizations are dealing with, you know, they have to have Chinese walls between clients or between organizations. You know, there are manufacturers that work for companies that are competitors. Um, one of the organizations that uh, we worked with in the past had, you know, Apple and IBM and Intel and all these, high, you know, Samsung, all, the, all those tech companies were their customers. And you could not share practice from one manufacturing plant to another manufacturing plant on certain types of things. On other things, you could. So you really have to be very selective in how you're doing this. And, you know, in, people can inadvertently upload things that contained very uh, proprietary information, and you really have to safeguard that. So a lot of the security protocols can be based on analysis of, of content. Um, now, the other thing is that you can start to also look at <clears throat> overarching patterns that you leverage machine learning algorithms, machine learning approaches that can identify patterns of fraud or patterns of low risk, right? So when you start looking at large amounts of text, there are certain algorithms that can start to say, you know what, I'm going to group these applications in this pile over here 
that need further scrutiny because they contain certain signals that tell me that the, this could be fraud or this could be high risk. And, and again, that, those are text analytics and content analytics approaches that are trying to make sense of that unstructured content. Now, <clears throat> it may not be a single thing. It may be a combination of very subtle uh, clues and very subtle signals that add up to that pattern of fraud. And again, these are the types of things that are increasingly um, uh, becoming more and more practical. One that's a little bit unusual is a, a development of question and answering systems. Many times what we need to do is, as I started to mention, people don't want a, a whole list of documents as a result. They want an answer to a question. Well, how do you do that? You actually have to take the content that you have and curate it and structure it in such a way that you're pulling out the nuggets of, of, of value. And you can actually use content analytics in order to start to extract that and chunk and componentize content. Uh, none of these are all automatic, right? <clears throat> Many of these require hybrid approaches. Uh, <clears throat> training of intelligent virtual assistants and chatbots, that's actually an area that's, that's emerging and you would not think that that's a text uh, and, and content analytics application, but it certainly is. Um, <clears throat> I don't have time to go into all the details of that, but I'll just show you a little bit of, of that. Customer sentiment. <clears throat> that's a that's a big one, right? We're trying to understand things like uh, likelihood to recommend, or you're trying to identify um, problems from social media. We're mining all of this stuff, so being able to understand customer sentiment and get that feedback from unstructured content is is a big deal. Uh, prediction of credit risks is really analogous to uh, to the uh, pattern of fraud, right? You're saying what are the what are the what are the signals in these uh, applications that indicate that this is a risk. Uh, one that I saw the other day <clears throat> said that uh, uh, when these mobile application providers uh, were, were actually extending credit on mobile devices. And one of the things they found is a correlation of the number of times that a person let their battery go dead on their cell phone with higher credit risk. I mean, that's a fascinating signal. It's, it makes sense, right? <laughs> You're not really gauging your, your resources correctly here. You think you can go farther on that battery charge, and you can. Maybe you think you can go farther on your paycheck. So you can see there's some intuitive <laughs> correlation. Uh, and then feature extraction from product data. That's where you're starting to see uh, product uh, information systems that are, are leveraging some of these techniques as well. High-level approach. This is a high-level approach, and this is kind of very analogous to lots of approaches, but you know, understanding your objectives, right? There's lots of tools out there, there's lots of uh, techniques, there's lots of methodologies, but what are you really trying to accomplish? Which of those classes of application you're trying to build? What is your business objective? Typically, you need to model a domain. Now, I'm gonna contradict that a little bit in my next slide, talking about how where you don't necessarily need that. You can look for patterns and you can group things according to similarity, but modeling the domain, meaning what are all the entities, what are all the metadata structures, what are all the relationships, that really helps you with your, with your content analytics because it helps you predefine buckets, it helps you predefine entities, and so on. Any uh, of these uh, applications can function better with a domain model. Uh, and, and, and defining the classification approach, right? you can use rules-based, you can use uh, statistical uh, applications, you can use lots of different types of rules uh, applications, lots of different types of statistical, but those are the big buckets. When you're using a rule base or rule approach, rules-based classification, you need to develop the rules. When you're using a statistical approach, you need to have the training set. So what's the example data that I'm going to input for this? And then the big thing is refinement and measure. You've got to run, refine, measure. You've got to run, refine, measure. So these things, again, they're, they're not happening uh, automatically. Now, this is just a comparison of a couple of different approaches, and there are different forms of this classification. I mentioned rules-based. Uh, you can uh, uh, leverage these pretty quickly. There's, it's, it's clear they can be cumbersome. Uh, they're very literal, so when you're saying, if it contains this term, do this, put it in that bucket, there can be lots of uh, false positives. Uh, you have the challenge around the level of granularity. Uh, if you have ambiguous terms, uh, that's going to be a problem. Uh, the, the, the changes of terms, the variation of terms. So there's some lots of challenges around rules-based. Uh, statistics says, well, do you need a taxonomy? You could use a taxonomy. You don't absolutely have to, but you can. But you're really taking training sets 
which can be very challenging, and you're using those to, uh, to say either give me more like this or put these in a similar bucket. Uh, there's some challenges around the uh, transparency and how, of how those um, uh, algorithms work. There can be some, some mystery. They can look like um, uh, black boxes, and you end up with is majority overrules truth. In other words, if you have lots of examples of something, it, it, it leverages those examples. If you, so terminology, terminology, occurrence, and things like that. Uh, entity extraction. Um, you don't have to have a taxonomy. You could use one. You have less subjectivity, uh, and the rules are simpler. But you're basically saying, if it contains this term, put it in this bucket. If it, if it have these names, these account uh, customer names, if it has these, you know, biochemical pathway names, it could be any name, but you're saying here's a name list, and if it contains it, I'm going to look for that, I'm going to pull it out. Um, and you do have to have some rules with that, and you do have to have validation. And then the other one here is structure. It's really looking at if you have documents that have a, a predefined structure, you can pull things out by looking for them in that location. You, you know, it says no, no, no taxonomy required. Again, these are all subtleties. In some cases, you do need this, but you're really looking for well-structured documents, and you're saying, in this location, I can pull my uh, summary of the process. Um, uh, if we had uh, 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 policy documents for an insurance company, and they all had very clear structures, so you could start to deconstruct those by looking for certain headings and certain structures. Again, this is just looking at it a different way. What's the business objective? Are you trying to do migration? Are you trying to remove your 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 un, your your redundant, outdated, and trivial content? Are you trying to extract product data? Are you trying to understand customer feedback, eliminate PII? You do, for the most part, need some information structure. You know, you the main model would be helpful. Uh, you do should have some metadata structures. You should have whitelists or entity lists and, and the entities themselves. And then what's your classification approach? Is it a rules-based? Well, you gotta create rules. And you know, what's the rot type criteria? Uh, is there a content threshold for duplication, for example? Uh, you know, are there outdated file types? Is it looking for certain uh, 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 terminology or certain patterns? Are there you know, looking for social security formats or phone number formats or or text preceding a, a, some information, whatever it might be, or the entities, the exceptions, and so on. Or you can say, I have a statistical approach. I'm going to look for this training set. I have documents that contain these characteristics. I'm either going to look for more of them, or I'm going to look for exceptions from them. Or I'm going to look for more examples that go into this category, right? So, so again, th there's a wide range of different things that you can have. Um, in these training sets. And the biggest piece of this is to say you have to iteratively test. You have to look for outliers. You have to adjust your rules. You have to look for the comparison of a small set of manually classified with your machine derived, right? What's the level of effort? What's the quality? It's always a trade-off. You know, if you have to create a thousand, you know, node taxonomy and you need 50 documents per node for a training set, well, that's 50,000 documents for your training set. Well, you only have 60,000 documents, right? Or how much time? So there's always this trade-off of the level of effort with this. But that just gives you sort of a high-level view of what these things look like. <clears throat> Here's an example, <clears throat> as I started to mention, of looking at IP. In this case, a document is uploaded, um, and when it is, it's analyzed as it's being uploaded, comparing the occurrence of terms, <clears throat> customer names, and other types of information, uh, this happened to be a fabrication plant. When those two things were there, then it was flagged and said, hey, you may be uploading restricted content. Are you sure you want to do this? Or if you do, you need to go through this other approval process or workflow process. Um, here's an example of looking at product uh, features. Again, this is saying I have PDFs, but they're not searchable, or I can't do faceted search on them. I can extract that, and I can use analytics to extract the facets, the values for the facets. Here's an example where I'm doing this, a similar type of thing where I'm looking for base product attributes and then I'm looking for the variants. And the variants are, you know, red, yellow, blue, small, medium, large, et cetera, et cetera. But, but it's helping to organize product data. And again, these are text analytics and content analytics approaches that are helping in this particular uh, situation. We're taking 
uh, unstructured content and we're trying to add some structure to it. Here's analytics applied to customer feedback. This is the likelihood to, likelihood to recommend. And you can start to say, well, you know what? When a customer says something, I say, you know, I waited too long and that guy on the phone was a dope and uh, my battery ran out. Well, those are three di distinct issues that can fall into different classifications. And by doing the analysis on this, you can start to say, well, what are the concepts that these utterances represent, right? What are the things that they're saying and, and how do I start um, grading my different processes and my different parts of the organization and my different departments on this stuff? And we've been talking about hundreds, uh, hundreds thousands, tens of thousands of comments in different areas on social media, on um, voice of the customer data. All of this needs to be analyzed and put into, into um, uh, structure. When we start building these applications that I mentioned on question answering, you're really taking chunks of content you know, FAQ, troubleshooting guides, e-learning, and you're componentizing. You can use machine-assisted uh, approaches by giving examples. This is the structural analysis that I mentioned before. You do need to build standardized domains and you can tag. So you have machine-assisted approaches for text analytics and content analytics, both at the front end and then later on for, you know, uh, tagging for ingestion. And this is for some of these emerging um, tools around cognitive computing. They're, you know, we, this is not easy. <laughs> We've built prototypes using these tools. It's it's still early uh, days for this stuff, but but you know we're going to get there, and, and uh, it's going to really change things. If you haven't had a chance to read uh, Tom Davenport's book on only humans need applied, this is kind of the vision and the extension of of these analytics approaches. Here's an example of again dark data from a from a big picture perspective, you have a lot of stuff that's out there. You have to say, well, what's there? Do we have value? Is there a risk in keeping it? Is there a risk in deleting it? You know, how do I know what's there? How do we separate low from high? And what you can do is you can say, I have this big piece of content, a big body of content, and think, well, I have purchase orders, and I can, again, use either rules-based or statistical approaches, and I have contracts. And guess what? I have seven-year retentions on contracts and 10-year retentions on purchase orders. Well, I can then say anything that is over, uh, well, I can also get rid of duplicate. Anything over 10 years, I'm just going to delete, and anything that's duplicate, I'm going to delete. But it just gives you that sense of you can do the same thing, rules for outdated content, rules for the trivial content, and so on. But it just gives you a way to start making sense of what you have. Now, <clears throat> you can kind of look at analytics from a couple of different perspectives. I'm going to finish up pretty quickly here. Descriptive, what is it? What happened? What do I have? Uh, predictive, what's going to happen? Uh, what, uh, what will people need? And you can kind of think of predictive as also predicting what people need from a content perspective, right? You can think of predictive analytics as saying, well, what do I think they need? And actually, what's interesting is a search engine can be considered a form of predictive analytics. You're getting, taking a signal of a search term and you're predicting what result they want. And the more signals you have by understanding who they are and what their context is and you know their demographics or region or product purchases, the more you can predict what that result will be. These are recommendation and, and, and predict prescriptive says, I'm going to try to guide this outcome by giving something to somebody. So again, when you start thinking about the structured and the unstructured pieces of this, you can start adding, you know, these, these different types of analytics, <clears throat> both structured and unstructured, to say, well, how are we getting people to the site? What content are they clicking on? What helps them make decisions? What's giving them some insights? We can analyze click paths. We can analyze the information that people are using in their, throughout their life cycle. We can, say, we can, we can, we can use the text analytics <clears throat> approaches by getting feedback, but also looking at behaviors. What content leads to conversion? What content leads them to pick up the phone? These are all applications of content and uh, text and data analytics. And the ways to think about this is you have to say, well, what's our hypothesis? What do we think people need to do and what will cause them to do something? We have to collect the data. We have to look at issues when they're not successful. And then we have to remediate. And this actually can be put into um, uh, uh, metrics-driven governance playbooks. What you're doing is you're taking the insights <clears throat> from these analytics uh, initiatives 
and you're acting on them. You're creating a playbook to say, this is how I actually should be handling an intervention. A lot of times people say, well, how do I know this is working or that's working, whether it's search or content or taxonomy, it doesn't matter what it is. But you have scorecards and analytics that you can apply at every level. You can look at content quality and data quality. That can be done with, a, with an analytics, a content and, and uh, analytics and text analytics approach. But you can also measure business process, right? You can measure the outcomes. And again, this is a combination of structured and unstructured because content supports a process. And then you can say, well, really, what's my business objective and what am I trying to do and how well am I meeting that outcome? And, and again, you have, and then of course, that's linked to the enterprise strategy, but you have linkages and feedback mechanisms throughout all of these processes. So there's some truly amazing technologies and approaches to getting more insights out of the content that you have, that the data that you have, the applications that you have, where you can truly optimize the experience, you can get people what they need, you can impact conversions, you can impact retention. I mean, what's amazing is just how uh, evolved this application space has become. And, and so I just hope that I could open up your eyes a little bit on some of the potential applications of looking at content and text analytics and, again, combining those with the, uh, the structured data. My email is um, sepeterly.com. You can uh, reach me on Twitter or watch our, um, our organization on, tw on Twitter. And, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer those. So back to Teresa. Well, thank you. And we wanted to ask you a poll question. And so we're have people ask you to come up to your keyboards and answer this question for us. What is your biggest challenge related to collecting data? Is it streamlining the processes, web and mobile connectivity, uh, changing compliance needs, escalating costs? Improving your customer experience. Um, check the, the one point on here, which is your biggest challenge within your organization related to data collecting. And while you're answering that question, I'm going to invite Sid, Sid Probstein to come on the line and just let him comment on what we're seeing here in the results before he goes, uh, begins his part of the talk. Sid? Thank you so much. It's great to be here, everybody. And uh, it's great to see this poll, poll results. Um, as I think that, uh, you know, as we go out and talk to folks about content analytics and going digital, streamlining processes is a huge part of what's required, um, along with change in compliance needs. So uh, we're going to talk a lot about that. And I think we'll talk a bit about improving the customer experience, too. Uh, so, so those are, it's excellent to have those kind of at the top three. And we'll give it another moment if there's any more results. I think we're, We've got all the results in. Good. Well, thank you so much again. Um, I'm Sid Probstein. I am the CTO and uh, VP of Solution Delivery at AI Foundry, uh, part of Kodak Alaris. We, um, I'm here to talk about automated handling of customer data. In, in particular, right, some of the challenges of digital transformation, um, how to, you know, kind of get the command and control over the business that you want to understand what's happening and to be able to uh, impact it. We'll talk about some of the key challenges. Uh, then we'll talk about barriers to automation because at the end of the day, uh, insight is very valuable, but, but it's a tool, right, for, uh, or, or a driver to automate processes and make us more efficient and in, as part of that. Right, we're also able to deliver a better experience. And then we'll give some specific concrete examples of uh, the power of content analytics uh, through business process dashboards, our, our AI manager, and uh, insight. Uh, we'll give some examples of how you can use uh, unstructured analytics to look for things like company connections. So first, I think, I believe if we had asked the question, are you in the process of digital transformation, everyone would, of course, uh, would say yes, it'd be overwhelming. Um, there's a, a mandate to do it. Everybody uh, is driving for it. And it's really one of the key elements of competition in building a competitive, sustainable advantage. And really, at the end of the day, part of what business folks want in a digital transformation is they want this, right? The complete command and control, the console, the flight platform that lets them oversee everything, look across all of the data, and not only understand and consume it, but to respond, right? To steer the ship, to, to augment or orchestrate the response. But 
we know that this is a, a truly challenging thing to achieve. Uh, these uh, uh, dashboards are spread across numerous lines of business uh, applications. In financial services, it may run into the hundreds, and the response mechanisms, you know, are, are never so neat as, as they appear here in a dashboard. So we can really break the, the challenges out in doing this into kind of five main categories, and of course, you know, they line up neatly with, uh, with our question earlier. Uh, streamlining processes, a large part of being efficient and being able to compete is about turning around things quickly. Right? People expect uh, immediate response when they apply for something, uh, and whoever gets back to them most quickly with a great price is very likely to win, um, far more than someone who has a more nuanced offering. Right? And so putting together the process uh, sometimes requires a lot of underlying work, like documents and data merging, uh, being able to connect some of those documents and data into business applications. These are big challenges, um, let alone the fact that you know, if you have to deal with paper process, which we'll talk about, uh, getting that into the process uh, is not easy. There's also always the question of connectivity, right? I think one of the great uh, uh, standard uh, ways of thinking now is that millennials uh, uh, really use mobile. Uh, well, and folks also use the web. And so being able to have a great experience across those and being able to move from one to the other while having a manageable system that you can, you know, uh, control and, and have a great experience through that you can measure parts of, that's, that's hard to do. Um, perhaps, though, more top of mind today, things like compliance needs, um, having access to all the originals, being able to detect uh, a fraud and other kinds of uh, phishing, and generally providing, you know, the, a range of security and privacy options, ensuring that the data is safe and complying with government regulation. Escalating costs, sometimes an issue, but not really. It's certainly not a, necessarily a huge driver. Um, but in the large, we have to think about some of the changes in the way we work now. If you think about moving to the cloud, operational expense suddenly can be much more expensive to pay per month for data, for example, than uh, some uh, servers that you paid for three years ago. Right? So the, the cost structure can be, can be different, even if it's not top of mind today. And also importantly, right, not sort of hand-in-hand -hand with streamlining the process, is improving the customer experience. Uh, fast is great, efficient is great, correct is great, not having to go back to the customer, being able to personalize it or tailor it, those, those are all the things that provide a great experience. So as we think about going digital, these are the kind of five lenses that, um, or five challenges that we see out there. One thing that exacerbates that is the digital overload, right? We, we do have, sort of here on the right-hand side, enormous lockers full of digital data, more uh, every, every year than in all previous years combined. The growth is, is very unchecked. And of course, there's an awful lot uh, writ, writ, written about that. There's also a ton of paper. We have um, increasing amounts of paper in particular industries. Uh, certainly, paper is still a part of many processes, particularly things like onboarding, right? Whether you're um, getting into a, a loan, whether you're taking out a, a, a mortgage, whether you're applying for health insurance, whether you're uh, filing particular types of legal documents, uh, certain activities, applying for, for benefits, et cetera, all can require uh, legal compliance and the uh, document retention. So these things cut across, really, uh, these concerns. They cut across our, uh, uh, all the things we're trying to do in automating processes and making things more streamlined. So I thought we'd look for a minute, really, at how automation, uh, where some particular challenges can be and how the five elements manifest. This is a, a diagram I found out uh, uh, that sort of presents a general digital process. And you can see here in the lower left-hand corner with our morning coffee, we may start with a keyboard and start working with applications, and that kicks off a series of business processes. Perhaps I make decisions as an analyst and I play, place trades, uh, or perhaps I create content or aggregate it and publish it out. goes through those gears, right, all those excellent automation gears there in the middle, brightly colored, and further downstream to the right, my colleagues or consumers can access that with their tablets or their mobile phones, their laptops, and it, it all looks awesome, automated, and fun. But I think there's a challenge. There's one of these little elements that doesn't quite fit in, and, and that's right here. Do you, do you see it? It's the paper that seems to slide seamlessly into those gears. And really, it would be more correct, I think, to put something like, then a miracle occurs, or at least some magic happens. At the very least, I think we should be more explicit and look into this particular uh, box. Let's drill inside. 
So behind the scenes, a document entering a digital business process probably starts with some kind of scanning activity, uh, a Kodak Alara scanner, uh, maybe it's a, a phone scan of a photo, and that's delivered perhaps through some secure mechanism. More than likely, in most industries, a human being is going to receive that, and they're going to type it in, they're going to verify it, they may have another team that reviews their work, potentially validates it by looking at other sources. Like if it's a customer-related document, for example, we might look to see if there's an existing customer ID on that uh, document. And they may code additional pieces of data, like the value of the customer or the order that it's related to. And there may be a third person here in the upper right-hand corner, perhaps, of this uh, uh, box where they are verifying it, so-called. In some industries, they have a, even terminology for it, such as stare and compare. Ultimately, the goal is all this typing and verification is to get the contents of this paper into a line of business application, like a loan origination system or a health insurance application system or a manufacturing onboarding system for service, any number of things. So this is obviously a, a, the kind of process that you learn to, to make a face about, right? It's, it's error prone, humans make mistakes, documents can be lost, the cost to refile one can be very costly. And moreover, as a process, Unless I go and really try and wire up, you know, force people to check in and check out the states of documents, create a sort of management layer for the humans who are doing this work, it's, it's an opaque process. It's really safe to say it's a barrier to automation. All of those people make it very hard to digitize this process and to streamline the process. It's even hard, frankly, to measure it. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So when we talk about paper, there's a lot of reasons why there are still warehouses full of it, right, and uh, still continuing to grow. In particular industries, there are regulations and uh, compliance requirements about retaining originals, providing those originals to others during transactions. Right? Very, very commonly, there's a, a, a robust market, of course, in mortgages and loans uh, when they're securitized. So there's a, a significant disclosure requirement there. In a lot of cases, really what's happening is a consumer, through the onboarding process or purchase process, is providing backup material, right? And that may be lengthy documents like bank statements or utility bills, housing re reports or evaluations. And it's not possible for them to sort of digitize those, type them in or enter them as, as structured data. It's really best for them just to take a, a, a scan of it. And, you know, here's another point. There's potentially a decent user experience. I uh, did a mortgage recently and I was really surprised it was different than when I'd done 20 years ago, uh, which involved a lot of trips to, to branch, uh, bench, bank branches uh, and attorneys. In this case, it was mostly taking photos of documents I was sent after I filled them out and sending them back to the bank. And I remember thinking, wow, it's like having a concierge. But really, uh, from the perspective of someone who oversees loan operations, it's a bit opaque. Uh, very much that barrier example that, that I referred to earlier. You know, you don't know if everyone's got their documents, if somebody's lost a laptop or called in sick. You don't know the state of a document. And that actually turned up very much uh, when I called right before going on a trip to Europe. Uh, I, I said, I need to know, do you have everything you need from me? It really was very hard for them to answer that question um, because they didn't have the process. They had to go and find out where are those documents spread across three desks and four branches. And they said, we think so, but we won't know for another day or so. Right. So not necessarily a great experience from the perspective of analytics and am I, do we have completion? And the last point, of course, is that security is important for certain paper elements. So a solution to this problem, to this barrier to automation, is to start thinking about documents very much as if they were data items and to put them through a life cycle. The actionable intelligence life cycle provides a full range of technologies to address all of the phases in these document lives. You find an analog in IT, in the data warehousing space, right? There's a, a life cycle plan for data. Similarly, the actionable intelligence life cycle talks about capturing and analyzing documents, storing and versioning them, providing for managing, organizing, searching, using metadata, uh, creating network effects with, uh, with documents like sharing and collaborating, right? If I transfer these documents between other parties, I can optimize the work I do, the costs that uh, accrue to me as, as I create things, lower my cost of goods sold. 
I can use these documents to produce insight, right? I, among other things, metrics and reporting, the kind of thing that was missing in a pure paper process, right? Where people are typing all of it in. I only know what happened at the end, how long things took. I don't have any kind of real-time insight. And finally, um, documents do move through the life cycle and they have an end. Uh, for many documents, they need to migrate to cheaper storage, to secured storage, or perhaps to archive or deletion. And so you wanna really think about documents this way and through technologies and approaches to turn documents into data, you can do that. You can think that way. That's important to differentiate basic capture where we're out potentially um, using scanners and scan technology or just images that we may have, applying image science and routing those images, perhaps with manual tags, very often human tags, into workflows and storage. It's very simple in a, in a sense to do, but it doesn't provide value. It only allows me to look at the image. It doesn't let me do analytics or really deal with it other than in a very abstract way. How many images is my process? I can't tell you how quickly a certain case took until it's manually entered, right? At which point, again, it's too late. Transactional capture, which is what we really specialize in doing, you can pull the data from anywhere, whether it's a web server or a watched folder, it could be a secure upload, it could be a link from a cloud storage. The image science is there, absolutely, but there's more advanced approaches to treating these things like documents, using classification technology and data extraction to turn documents and forms into structured data. Now, that's certainly better when it's time to inject that data into a workflow, because at that point it can be fully routed in without the humans, and so it's obviously much faster, we also, because it's automated, we are able to pull in other data and analyze how the flow is occurring, what, how quickly the documents and extraction are moving, and give you document analytics. That can be linked with external sources to really get great insight. So how many loans are coming in, how many were classified in a particular way, how many uh, achieved different scores. Right. Automating it and bringing it all together really gives us a different view and allows us to, of course, measure and optimize the system so much better. Now, this is great, but what about that analytic view? Well, once you start to measure, you automate the process of turning documents into data and putting them through workflows, you are measuring absolutely every step of the way. And so each user in the, each consumer of information can get their own customized view. Here's an example of what an investment officer might view, right? They can always click from their sort of immediate concern an application that they're working on and they can click in and see any single document or you could get a manager view where I'm looking at many loan officers and I can see kind of what their aggregate process is aggregate progress throughput where things are delayed what kinds of challenges they're dealing with and I can even do that from a sort of organizational perspective looking at the org chart and then if I'm the CXO I want to see across all managers and all divisions Give me that throughput. Tell me about the challenges they're having. What kind of loans are we writing? What kind of, uh, you know, uh, documents are dropping out for human review? Because that is part of it, right? If there's always a possibility of a poorly scanned document that can't be deciphered. So we still drop that out to humans. The key is that they transition from doing all the work to really just dealing with the exceptions. Here's another angle, right? Once we convert documents into data and we extract it and make it structured, we can look at other uh, kind of angles on the data as opposed to simply reading through it. We can say, tell me how different documents or different parts of documents like companies or ventures are related. And we could look, for example, at a set of transactions and the supporting documents, and we could turn all of that into a, a chart like this, a graph showing the relationships between companies. And we can explore that, drilling into the documents that actually expose the relationships to really understand why and uh, what the nature of that relationship is. Long story short, by turning documents into data and really understanding how to link those to both the workflow that you're ultimately orchestrating them through and providing analytics on top of it with a customized view for each of the consumers in the ecosystem that's involved in the process, you can really transform the experience, streamline the process, and cut costs as well, um, along with saying, actually having a much easier time complying. The simple reason that data that's digital is far easier to can secure and route correctly, and the chance of it going to a sort of uh, catch-all area where it could be potentially exposed to folks who shouldn't see it is actually substantially reduced.
here's just a little something about AI Foundry, uh, how we've come together to solve some of these challenges and uh, some of the uh, different special differences that make us uh, uniquely equipped to challenge, tackle these challenges. It's been great chatting with you, and I would love to take some questions now. Well, thank you. I'd also like to thank um, Seth for doing such a terrific job of setting all this up. Oh, thank you so much. You're too kind. <laughs> well, in addition, Seth, or, uh, um, Sid has a few other additional links here, uh, links over to his website, and these links are also in the resources list that's to the right of your slide area. So just wanted to let you know there's some really good additional reading in there. And um, so just wanted to let you know that that's available. Um, and you know we have been listening here to Sid, Sid Probstein of AI Foundry, and before that, Seth Early of Early Information Science. And so I do want to get to some of the questions that you have uh, been submitting. Um, thank you. And uh, feel free to uh, continue to submit your questions. And uh, here, Seth, I want to ask this first question out to you because it, it came in while you, uh, earlier in mm -hmm. the early part of your, your part of the presentation. And this person is asking if you can provide um, your insight in how content analytics can mm -hmm. assist with the compliance um, with export sure. control and DOD compliance. Absolutely. So uh, when you start looking at, at uh, export controls, uh, that is saying there are certain things that uh, we cannot uh, send overseas. There are certain things we can't send to particular uh, countries. Uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, the issues are uh, – it, it can many times be covered by looking at the content and the documentation. So one is on traffic um, arms regulations, the other is export administration regulations. It's basically big buckets of things that you can't send. There's documentation that's representative of what those items are. If they're physical goods, you have descriptions of those physical goods. If you have documentation, and so you can look for patterns of information, either with rules-based or with statistical. You say, here's some examples of stuff that that uh, falls under these classifications. Let me compare this to this bill of lading or this documentation that's going along with this particular shift. And let, let me make sure I can screen this and be sure it doesn't get flagged. So absolutely, it's a great example. And basically, you're looking at the content and the documents that are going along with those, those goods. Uh, again, uh, shipping documents, uh, uh, manuals, any types of um, you know, technical specifications. So it's basically picking the training set uh, that represents the stuff you can't send, comparing that to what you have, and probably augmenting that with some rules-based classification as well as entity extraction and then doing some manual sampling. So, uh, so that's a very, very good application of, of uh, content analytics. Thanks. Yeah, this is it. I would add, uh, you know, I think you can use machine learning detection techniques generally um, with, with content analytics uh, for this purpose. So, for example, essentially saying, let's see how many uh, pieces of content are going to different sources, different locations, and by tracking that and watching the trend um, and identifying when uh, uh, negative events occur, right, you can then train a system that would uh, predict when that was going to happen or, or detect when uh, something anomalous was happening, meaning there's an unusual pattern of, of transmission of content uh, or tra unusual content uh, versus all other content. Mm -hmm. Good points. Thank you. Um, so I have a question for you. Someone was asking, uh, how difficult is this to integrate uh, the type of solution that you're talking about into existing systems? Well, uh, there, there's no doubt there's an integration uh, effort for some systems, uh, especially homegrown ones. But a lot of the industry standard systems, for example, in, in banking and financial services, uh, have open APIs, well-documented SDKs, et cetera, and it's, it's often straightforward. Also, there's a, a ton of migration to, you know, SaaS uh, platforms, cloud-based services, and often integration is very, very straightforward with those. Uh, for the rest, there's a, you know, tried and true set of tools to, uh, from ranging from ETL to extraction tools uh, to normalization tools uh, to extract the data, profile it, and, you know, link it in with other, other uh, data sources. So uh, I think we, great news, we live in a sort of the big data renaissance, and uh, there's an awful lot of uh, uh, focus on data integration and many, many uh, great options. Um, Sid, so you started off talking about um, uh, a lot of um, 
the, the capture as a, as, a, as a point to start to, to get into this. What, and someone's asking, what if they don't have paper? Um, but just realizing in this day and age, capture is so much more than just paper scanning. Oh, absolutely right. So, you know, part of building a decent um, a, a digital experience can be designing digital forms um, and, you know, having a, a, an interface for somebody who wants to provide you with, with rich information uh, through a mobile phone. It can be a challenge in and of itself. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the approaches here would start with, you know, that kind of input form, a digital input model, but then use the same techniques um, uh, using text analytics uh, potentially as opposed to uh, image analytics, right? because you're not necessarily talking about form data, but using that to identify uh, key entities or other data items to structure the unstructured, if you will, and then inject that into the business process. So it's, it's absolutely applicable. And, and really, at the end of the day, uh, the enterprise is a wash in templates. And generally, this kind of image plastering and classification is, is really good at that. Uh, identifying, for example, that this may be a brochure template, then allowing us to move on to extraction or other kinds of dispositions, right, like as Seth was referring to earlier in the dark data case, maybe we want to archive older brochures and keep newer ones, or maybe it's budgets, right, in the case of financial documents and an Excel spreadsheet that, that has a particular style or template to it. Another question that's come in here, and, and uh, Seth, I want to direct this over to you. Someone's asking, how are domain models and taxonomies related? Mm -hmm. and, and more importantly, or yeah. additionally, how are they different? Right, right, right. It's, I'll even go you one better. I had a senior executive at, at, at a large insurance company handling global uh, processes asking the difference between a domain model and ontology. Now, that was a really tricky question, but it showed that he understood the nuances. So here's a domain model. Domain model is, is the big picture organizing principles about everything in your world. Your domain of insurance would have risks and regions and products and services and you know, document types and um, divisions and, and uh, job categories. It's really all of those different types of vocabularies and those different organizing principles, right? All the different things that you need to start thinking about. The taxonomies are the vocabularies within each of those areas. So what, what are all the products? What are all the services? And they can be hierarchies or they can be flat lists. The taxonomy has a little bit of a you know, uh, a connotation of a hierarchy doesn't always have to be. So there are lots of different words to kind of describe that. But think of that as the, the, the domain model is just the model without the terms, the big picture buckets, and then the taxonomies are the term list that goes within those buckets. Now, I'll also say an ontology is really all of that filled out along with the relationships between them because you can have products associated with services, you could have solutions associated with, with products. You could have risks and regions. So when you have all those relationships between the different things, that's the ontology. The ontology includes the domain model and all the taxonomies and the relationships between them and describes your world. So, so those are, so I gave you a bonus uh, definition of ontology, but domain model is just the organizing principles without the detail. The taxonomies are actually the, the lists in the specific terminology. Thank you for that clarification. Um, and I just have a little bit about AIM training and uh, some information, additional information available to you that's up on the slide right now. As you know, AIM offers a, a variety of different training programs online and, and in person. And we've also made some updates to our, um, I believe it's the EM and ERM programs. Oh, they're going to shoot me if I get that wrong. Um, but we've incorporated our master level with the case study work, um, all as offering it all online. So feel free to check out aim.org slash training uh, for more information there. Do you have another question here that I want to squeeze in here? Um, and uh, Sid, let me go ahead and ask this question over to you. Um, someone's asking about rolling out this type of, uh, of a analytics application? Is it something that can be done on a project basis? Because um, they're giving an example of what if they buy a company or move out of an office and just want to cut costs and not store mm -hmm. all the historical paper to archive. Um, where's the flexibility with a solution like okay. this? So uh, absolutely, projects are very common in this space when you have a 
you know, an M&A situation when in some cases you may be you know, moving out of a headquarters and you want to uh, reduce the amount of storage space uh, and, and potentially reduce the amount of paper that you have. Sometimes it's for compliance purposes, right? Maybe you're keeping stuff for uh, longer than you'd like to or you change the standard. Um, in, in all of these cases, right, the transactional capture approach is an awesome one to take. Quickly turn the paper and digital documents into structured data, uh, index that, put it into a content management system, right? Uh, part of the really solutions in this space should should offer that along with essentially case management. So you can do things like uh, you know, if you find a document that's interesting, maybe uh, an external party needs to review it, you could pass it to them securely, track the time that it's taking, right? The folks overall responsible for the uh, project, review the data and get it done in a certain period of time, have a dashboard so they can too see uh, how long things are going to take, how, what kind of progress they're making, right, and turn that, all that dark data into smart data uh, and move it, potentially migrate some of it to, you know, the, the sort of a, a home content management system. Some of it gets deleted, some of it gets archived. And, you know, you, if you do that a lot, right, then, of course, you may move from a project uh, model to having a platform type of deployment or, or uh, you know, developing your own center of excellence around that. Thank you. Um, we are getting to the end of our webinar hour, and uh, just want to remind everyone that we have been recording this webinar, and it will be available in the next day or two at AIM.org's resources webinars page. Um, don't forget to download the resources that are listed to the right side of your page. Also, uh, appreciate if you'll take a few minutes to uh, complete the survey that will open. Um, it'll open in a new browser tab when the uh, webinar is over with. I do value your, your feedback and would appreciate if you take some time to complete that survey for us. I very much want to thank our underwriter, AI Foundry. Without the support from our solution providers, AIM wouldn't be able to bring you these free educational programs like our webinar. So as we bring this webinar to a close, I do want to leave you with our speakers' closing thoughts or a key takeaway from today's discussion. So I want to begin first with Sid Probstein of AI Foundry. Your closing thoughts today. Well, thanks so much. I think uh, the power of digital transformation is so clear and such an important mandate. It manifests in all the different ways we interact with customers, whether it's onboarding or, or servicing, whether it's uh, you know trying to understand product quality issues or service issues or insight as to how we can best serve uh, serve them. It can be untangling uh, complex uh, transactions or webs of data that have accumulated. The key, I think, is to no longer treat it as it was that sort of special uh, special class of data. It's, it's not. Uh, there's no need to fear the unstructured world. Uh, taking these kinds of approaches, using content analytics, allows you to transform it into structured data that is much more traditional and, and predictable and real time. Uh, it doesn't require humans and uh, can can really build an automated process that will delight customers and stay compliant and uh, do all of that you know in a significantly different way than you've done it in the past. Thank you, Sid. And Seth Early of Early Information Science, your closing sure. thoughts today. Sure. So I would say uh, don't uh, don't be taken. Well, uh, do your base do the basic blocking and tackling around information management. That is, you know, try to make the information more findable for your users today. That's going to prepare you for the future uh, when you can leverage these emerging technologies. There's a lot of practical stuff that's out there, but there's also a lot of things that are still kind of uh, emerging and maturing, uh, the cognitive computing, a lot of the advanced uh, machine learning, but, but you still have to do the basics. Um, you still have to, to build out domain models and and enterprise architectures and, you know, um, a lot of folks are not paying attention to because they, they think that the technology is going to get so mature that you won't need any of that. But, in fact, it's anything you do to curate and better structure your information today using tools like AI Foundry or using other tools or using manual approaches will help you as these other tools emerge. And, again, don't just sort of push it off. Um, uh, do the basic blocking and tackling uh, get your data house in order, your content house in order, and uh, look at improving those processes today, and that will also help you build foundational capabilities for the future. Thank you, Seth, and and thank you, everyone, for your time today. I do value value the, the time that you take to listen to our webinars. For AIM, this is Teresa Resick, and we will see you on our next webinar, and have a good day. Great.